Three of Wave Talkers Live. Today, we're talking about emergency preparedness exercise that we all participated in yesterday. And my name is Chris Mattia. My call sign is Whiskey Six Alpha Hotel. And I'm joined today by my esteemed colleagues, as usual, David W0DHG and Dan NR6V. And uh, this is Wave Talkers Live. So, as we normally do, let me go ahead and unpin these guys. Uh, briefly, and then we will do our normal weekly check-in, and then we'll get right into it. So today's question, if you have access to WinLink, please send us a WinLink check-in. Send it to all three of us, W0DHG, NR6V, W6AH, and our tactical call sign, Wave Talkers. Uh, today's question, use the standard WinLink check-in form, but today's question in for the comment section uh, what is one takeaway that you've learned from a real world or a simulated emergency exercise? So let me go ahead and pull this down here real quick and we'll switch back over to the walk up. I'll put myself down in that corner so you can see what I'm doing here. So if you have access to Winlink, go ahead and fire up your copy of Winlink. And then come up here to the upper left, click on the new message. You're going to come over here to the select templates button. Go ahead and click on that. And you're going to click the little plus next to standard templates. And you're going to come down here. We're going to go into the mapping GIS forms. It's going to be hidden in there. So go ahead and click the plus next to that. And you're going to come down near the bottom and you should find that winlink checkin.txt. Just go ahead and give that a double click it should open up in your browser of choice. Now, if you've gone ahead and you've used a save set of settings and you know how to do that, you're, you're a WinLink expert, make sure you click the date and time so you set the current date and time from your saved template. Otherwise, everybody wants to go ahead and click that save date and time thing and it gonna, it's just gonna open up with the current date and time. Then you're gonna fill this out. Uh, this is an exercise. Let us know which band you're gonna send this in on and via which mode. This is where you're gonna enter in all of our call signs. It's just the three of us, W0DHG and R6V, W6AH, and our tactical call sign, Wave Talkers. Go ahead and fill that in there. Uh, the rest of this information is pretty self-explanatory. Down here in the comment section, this is where you answer the question, which is, what is one takeaway that you've learned from a real world or a simulated emergency exercise? When you fill that in, just go ahead and hit the submit button. It will give you a chance to change the name of the file if you would like. You don't have to. You can if you want. Um, but go ahead and close that. It should populate the message here with that information. Go ahead and post that to your outbox. And then go ahead and send that in. I'm going to click the open session button here. I'm just using Telnet because I'm connected to the internet. And I will go ahead and hit the start button. And let's see if we've got any messages coming in. And yes, we do have messages coming in from all over the world. Excellent. There's one coming in from Terry. Hi, Terry, coming in from ZL Land from New Zealand. Perfect. So we'll check back in later in the show as we get back to that. So let me bring myself back up here and maybe go over to this side and turn on. There we go. Turn on the slides. All right, let's dive into this because we had a really cool exercise yesterday. And as as you know, pretty much every exercise starts off with some kind of an announcement of this is a drill, this is a drill, this is a drill. Because usually the different groups, when you get started, put that initial announcement out over a repeater system, which is exactly what all of our participating groups did. We let everyone know that, hey, we're going to be operating doing this drill. We set what the time limit was going to be, how we were going to uh, operate. And then for the most part, people moved off to simplex frequencies or, or other methods of communication. The overall drill, though, was an emergency preparedness interoperability exercise. And what does that mean? Well, we're going to cut over to Dan here, and he's going to tell us the what, the where, and the who of what this exercise uh, was all about. So let me bring Dan up to stage here real quick. And as soon as I can find my mouse, there it is. And let me replace him. Hey, Dan, thanks. Why don't you, uh, can you walk us through uh, some of the information about what this exercise was? Sure. So First of all, why have an interoperability drill for, 
years up until three or four years ago in LA, uh, each of our MCOM groups operated independently. Many of us were in more than one group and we sort of associated together, but each group always did their own thing. And several of us started thinking about how impractical that was. Why? Well, first of all, Los Angeles County covers 4,735 square miles. There are 88 cities in the county. Um, we have rugged mountains, deep canyons, vast deserts, beaches, pretty much anything you can think of uh, in our area. And most importantly, we have earthquakes, wildfires, and floods. And as we saw last week, often more than one at once. Uh, last week, we had uh, several major wildfires in Southern California, and then we got rain. And normally, you'd think rain would be good if you've got fires going on. But we had uh, big floods. Uh, in one case, uh, the fire department had two vehicles stuck on a highway, two of their vehicles stuck on a highway. And in between them, they ended up finding 24 cars and 53 people trapped in the mud. So stuff does happen. Um, and most importantly, disasters don't respect jurisdictional boundaries. So fires cross over from city to city, county to county. Earthquakes obviously uh, cover huge areas. And so we need to know how to work together. So in this particular exercise, and by the way, the, the uh, scenario was that high winds uh, caused power outages and power lines down and power lines caused wildfires. So we had sort of uh, a bunch of things going on, um, all of which are very real possibilities. So who played in this uh, exercise? Uh, we had my group, Los Angeles City Auxiliary Communication Service. We service the whole city, but our primary uh, uh, contact is the fire department. Uh, we had Aries LAX Northwest, uh, we had the South Division and the High Desert Division all playing in this uh, scenario. Los Angeles County Disaster Communications Service, they're like my ACS group, but they cover uh, the county and they're primarily associated with the Sheriff's Department. Uh, Culver City has its own Aries group. Remember, I said we have 88 separate cities in the county. Many of them have their own amateur radio groups. Uh, we had City of San Fernando's EOC, uh, where they have a group of ham radio operators. And we had Ventura County, ACS, and Aries. That's one group that sort of serves two masters. So LAFD ACS, just an overview of how LA City is set up. Uh, we have four bureaus dividing the city. Within each bureau, there are either three or five battalions. Uh, my, my, my bureau, uh, Valley Bureau, has five battalions. The other three have only three uh, battalions and a total of 106 fire stations in the uh, group. Here's a picture, and I know it's probably small on your screens, but you can see from the colors uh, the different bureaus, and you can see how they're sort of oddly shaped and quite spread out. So the goals of the exercise for ACS, we wanted to get as many bureaus and battalion headquarters uh, covered with ACS operators. We wanted to move dispatch information from the bureaus to the battalions. In a disaster, the four bureaus become semi-autonomous. They sort of do their own thing. Uh, they obviously have to intercommunicate, but uh, the, the leaders in the uh, bureaus are pretty much running the show. So dispatch information, call information would come in to the bureau, and from the bureau, we would have to get that information out to the individual battalions uh, who would see that the... Uh, uh, appropriate fire resources are dispatched. Uh, we wanted to interact with other bureaus because, again, uh, each bureau is so somewhat independent, but on a big incident, we may need resources from one of the other bureaus. And then uh, lastly, we want to uh, interact with other MCOM groups 
uh, through the unified command uh, center uh, so that um, we had, we had um, injects built into the exercise that caused us to have to do that. And then lastly, uh, the Ares LAX High Desert Group is pretty isolated by both distance and mountains. And so we used uh, uh, HF, primarily Winlink, uh, to relay messages from the high desert into an ACS operator uh, at Fire Station 109. And then those messages were forwarded by VHF to the Unified Command. Uh, how we did staffing wise, we were able to staff all four uh, fire department bureaus. Uh, Valley Bureau had all five of its battalions covered. Uh, West Bureau had all three battalions covered. Central Bureau managed to do two of the three battalions, uh, including having operators at the LA City EOC. And our South Bureau staffed two of the three battalions. So this is where Unified Command was located. And again, I know the image is not that great, but this is on a mountain peak uh, on Mulholland Drive that sort of divides the San Fernando Valley from the rest of the city. Uh, this location is a former Nike missile base uh, uh, command and uh, uh, communications site. And it was chosen because it has an outstanding view both visually and RF-wise, to uh, a good part of the Los Angeles Basin. So it, it was decided that Unified Command would be located there. For ACS, uh, we had uh, set up in our Easy Up, uh, and we had uh, both voice UHF, VHF communications there, and we had WinLink, uh, which was done peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. Uh, we had uh, all WinLink messages from the city went to a relay point on Mount Hollywood. Uh, you probably all know the Hollywood sign. That's actually on Mount Lee. The next peak over is Mount Hollywood. And we had an op or a couple of operators there set up with uh, WinLink in a digipeating mode. And all but one of our stations was able to pass WinLink traffic through the digipeter. Fortunately, that station that couldn't go through the digipeter was able to make a direct connection. And later in the exercise, they were able to digipete. Um, Aries Northwest was located in the same basic area. They found a nice high spot uh, behind the yellow FJ cruiser there is the platform on which the big radar dome for the Nike base was originally housed. So that's a really good high location there. That's actually David's car uh, uh, set up uh, with an antenna in a uh, hitch mounted uh, mast. Uh, County DCS were nearby. And again, they set up an easy up and had uh, several radio operators on scene. Uh, Culver City Aries, uh, again, you can't tell the relationship, but they're all fairly close together, uh, in some cases shouting distance, other cases maybe a little bit beyond that. So for ACS, this is our staffing in Valley Bureau. Uh, I was at Fire Station 88 with uh, David in the picture there, uh, another David, and uh, we have a permanent location at Fire Station 88, which is a very large fire station uh, with a lot of training facilities there. And uh, we have this uh, former semi-trailer uh, with uh, pretty much all band coverage with the exception of uh, uh, 160 meter uh, HF, but we have pretty much everything else. And we were acting as Valley Bureau. So all messages to Valley Bureau stations came through us and we were very busy uh, from the get-go. I intended to shoot some video and it just wasn't gonna happen. We were between being on the radios, uh, covering VHF, UHF. Uh, we had WinLink running in peer-to-peer -peer mode uh, in the room in the back of that picture, uh, but that we didn't have to pay much attention to that during the, uh, during the drill. 
Uh, North Valley Station uh, operated. Uh, that's a former fire station that we've been privileged to have the use of. Uh, this is actually an older picture with our old uh, uh, mobile command uh, vehicle that we had. Unfortunately, time and rodents uh, <laughs> made that uh, unusable and it's it's long since gone. But uh, we're very fortunate to have that uh, in uh, the Sun Valley area in the North San Fernando Valley. Uh, Battalion 10, uh, we had an operator at Fire Station 39, which is the newest uh, fire station uh, in the uh, city. Uh, that fire station replaced one that was built in either the late twenties or early thirties. And it was operational till just that the one here. on Balboa. No, um, that, uh, uh, that station is on Oxnard, um, okay. in, uh, Van Nuys. Okay. And, uh, the former station was a really cool old station, but it just no longer served the needs. Uh, and so it took them a long time to get this built, but, uh, it's a really wonderful facility. Uh, Battalion 12, I don't have any pictures, but they were at Fire Station 98, which is the battalion headquarters for 12s. Uh, battalion 14, uh, Fire Station 60, one of the older stations. And, and usually in the older stations, there's just no room for our vehicles. Uh, they're very tight on space. So typically we will pick uh, a parking lot or a park adjacent uh, to operate from. Uh, we find that works better and keeps us out of the way. Uh, typically, when we ask, the stations are very welcoming, um, and some of them actually have set up uh, space for us inside the stations. Again, Battalion 15, I don't have a picture of it, but that's the uh, Fire Station 70 is the Battalion 15 headquarters. Again, kind of an older station, uh, very tight space there. Uh, Battalion 17, we actually had two members in Battalion 17, uh, uh, one at Fire Station 84, which is the battalion headquarters, and we had another operator over at Fire Station 105, and so we had good coverage in Battalion 17. Um, this is where we had the, um, the uh, HF relay. This is uh, a helipad or former helipad at Fire Station 109. Uh, it is uh, no longer in use for several reasons, but uh, they're very welcoming to us. Uh, we use that site for field day every year and uh, really a good, a good site. And we're pretty experienced at setting up there because of that. And they primarily did voice and uh, wind link uh, relays from the high desert for Aries. In West Bureau, uh, we had uh, Battalion 4 covered with Fire Station 5. Uh, this is a big fire station down by the airport. And uh, as you can see, we uh, uh, are sort of crammed in among storage. But we've got some pretty nice equipment there in the cabinets behind. And uh, throw up a table and we're able to operate there. And that's a real critical location for us. Uh, fire Station 5. Our fire station 82, rather, in Battalion 5 had two operators there. Uh, you can see the uh, uh, electric car being used as power for the one operator there. And then the other operator operated uh, off the back of his pickup truck. Uh, fire station 9, another fire station where they just set up adjacent to the station and a pretty simple setup uh, a uh, uh, radio and a little table and a chair and uh, some hydration, and they were ready to go. Uh, Mount Hollywood was the relay link, again, I mentioned. Uh, this is the peak next to the Hollywood sign, or next to Mount Lee, where the Hollywood sign is, and is a very, very good location for us. And uh, we were glad to be there. Uh, the uh, parks uh, uh, rangers have been very uh, accommodating to us uh, at that site. Central Bureau, uh, we had uh, a couple of operators out at uh, Fire Station 55, which is Battalion 2 headquarters. Um, you can see John Minger there on the right, uh, set up there. Uh, they had a little bit of trouble getting wind link in through the relay, but eventually worked that out. Uh, this is our EOC, uh, the city EOC. We have a radio room that's off the main 
uh, EOC floor. Uh, we have four operating positions there. Uh, typically, we only staff two of them, uh, but uh, we do have uh, wind link capability uh, and uh, HF and VHF UHF uh, in that in that facility. South Bureau don't have any pictures, but we were able to uh, have one operator down in the port of Los Angeles, which is kind of the very south end of the city. And we had another operator working in Battalion 18. And that's the end of my presentation. We'll send it back to Chris. All right. Thanks a lot, Dan. Let me uh, let's see. Let me switch back over to me. There we go. And so this is the overall structure that that we had. Essentially, we had that unified command that Dan was talking about that was located up at the Nike site. And then we had uh, basically a command structure for each of the major different groups that were participating and then all of their structure of, of folks underneath of it. So all of the information was kind of flowing up into into one location. So let's dive in just a little bit more into a couple of the different groups. So. Ares, our, our mission was primarily a training mission. And so we had a relatively flat structure underneath of the Ares command. All of the individual operators were located out at the various hospitals uh, that were being served for all of our served agencies. And, and this is, again, this was, we were really focused a lot on training new operators, bringing them into a couple of different roles. So I have a little video to be able to show. Uh, let me switch over to that uh, really quick. Let me see let's do that and that. And let's see if this works. Just Did you say, can you comply? Yes. You already said that, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's it. That's okay. No, normally, it's going to take a while by the time they get them all to figure out. If they so they're going to come back to us now? Probably. Okay. You, you contacted Northwood. Okay. West Hills is requesting it. So now we hey, James, what are you set up for here? Uh, we're doing some uh, digital logging, essentially, attempting to capture all the facts. Thank you. Several victims, activate decom. So we're telling this to Valley Press. Yep. Valley Press, this is net control. LAFD is transporting several victims. Activate the car. Okay, I talked about they're transporting victims here to the Valley Craft. Affirmative. Please activate decon. Activate decon. Valley Press, did you get the entire message? Uh, could you start at the beginning, please? This is net control. LAFD transporting several victims. Activate the car. Okay, could you just go a little slower? Like, see, and um, if you can start from the beginning. Roger that. LAFD transporting several victims. Activate. I have LS, LAFD transferring several victims activating decon. Copy that. And six LSD. This is Sally Craft. But it's 76 hot and ready. That's what we that's what we can do. That's why I think we're going to be first of all. All right, so so then this station here, this was my um I was operating the Winlink station. 
that was uh, that was used for the Aries setup. And um, I see questions coming in in the chat a little bit. So I I was set up there to to run just simplex. Uh, run um, uh, Winlink with the the Aries group. We had a couple of operators that set up and were able to do uh, voice as well as Winlink. But for the most part, most of the Aries operations uh, that was running, at least with with our group in the Northwest, was all uh, primarily just voice. Uh, and and when I showed up, one of the things that I do want to talk about a, a little bit as we go through. It, since we spoke a little bit earlier about in previous episodes about creating your go bags and your go kit. So my setup is pretty much a go kit as I think about it. I have a lot of individual components that I roll in and I, I set up and I configure however I'm going to need to operate. And one of the challenges that I certainly ran into, and we're going to go into this a little more in the in the lessons learned, was I operate with a bunch of different radios in a bunch of different modes. And so when I got there and set up, suddenly I was asked to be able to operate in a particular mode that was not the normal way that I operate. So we were starting to pass our traffic uh, via direct peer to peer uh, via VHF, and I primarily operate with with HF. So having to be able to step through live the configurations ended up being a real challenge that I faced uh, in doing my my overall setup. It took me a little bit longer to get myself set up and to get on the air. Ultimately, what I ended up using was my ICOM 705 and the Surface Go tablet. Uh, I had intended on using the D710G, which that ended up being used for voice. And then we also had the 7300 for doing uh, HF traffic as we needed to. So it's just a quick little look at the the overall setup that I had for Winlink. We'll, we'll come back to that in just a little while. Uh, the next group is DCS, and this was their kind of overview of their communications flow of information. They had various different operators that would feed information uh, into each of their different districts. They had multiple districts, as Dan was, was mentioning. And those districts would then feed their information into the DCS command, which was in direct communication with the Sheriff's Communication Center, as well as the unified command that we had up on the hill. And so we have a little video that also kind of talks about that from, from one of their operators. Was a, a communicate sure. with the sheriff's communication center. We also have radios that we were using to communicate with our own disaster communication service districts. In my case, uh, Lameda, South Los Angeles, and then there's Lost Hills. And then also uh, these guys were operating Winlink digital traffic that was going into the sheriff's communication center as traffic was relayed from LA City Fire ACS and the Aries organization. So then the third group that, uh, the third major group that was there, and Dan spoke a lot about the ACS structure that was, that was set up. Um, and they did both voice and digital, as Dan was mentioning. I was really impressed with the digital operations and the Winlink operations in particular that the ACS group did. Uh, for the exercise. And so this kind of gives you a little bit of an overview. Uh, there's the DigiPeter that Dan was was talking about that was set up and the different operators or different stations would would bounce uh, simplex or um, not simplex, peer-to-peer uh, -peer traffic through the DigiPeter and into the ACS command that was located up on the hillside. There was also uh, for some of the further out locations, uh, out in the high desert, those operators were sending in their traffic uh, generally via HF into a hybrid station that was then uh, then afterwards relaying those messages in via peer-to-peer -peer via VHF once they got uh, further down into the valley. And so we have a little video of the setup from ACS as well. Let me go ahead and uh, roll that. The command for the fire department, and he is uh, basically now advising all of the bureaus to terminate the exercise and return back for checkout to our repeater. We've been doing all this without a repeater. 
uh, Gary has been the Winlink operator and uh, through peer to peer Copy and Italian also five, through, K6 CSB. Uh, uh, forwarding, we have been exchanging messages with the Antelope Valley, the high desert area, and that's been going either direct or through a, uh, one of Thank two you. stations that are otherwise located uh, Battalion this way, uh, Hollywood yes. Hills or over at Fire Station 109. You are clear to demobilize. Moving on to Valley Bureau and our 6B. Uh, uh, you are clear to demob. Italian 10, KD6 BSM, Fire Station 39. KD6 BSM, uh, uh, Italian 10, Fire Station 39. What's your basic wind link setup here? Uh, signal link. And the butt off. Pretty basic. Uh, and my GPS antennas up here. That's going right through. What uh, what wind link protocols were you running? We're running Vera uh, P to P. Because we wanted to go um, wanted to go through a didgeridoo station. We had one station set up, and everyone in the valley here is going through them to me. And then also we have uh, a HF wind link station set up over at one hundred and nine. Mm -hmm. So they're also sending messages backwards and forwards for them, as well as, and they're hooked up to uh, uh, High Valley, uh, Desert Valley um, stationary areas, I think it is, mm -hmm. on their HF with them. So that's here on the uh, HQ. Yeah, it's trying to find it. So norm, uh, normally I was, I was just returning a acknowledgement back mm -hmm. to you. I no, may put on direct and then I don't need this. And you're just sitting there waiting on that, right? Yeah. And then when somebody does ping it, okay, yeah. Yeah. And then I make sure the session's open. Gary Bill's that... one more message oh. to send you peer to peer. Oh. All right. I was about ready to shut down. All right. So I should be ready up to in the safe. So there should be a message coming in now. Mm -hmm. Now here it comes. <clears throat> they can go ahead and send a message. That's on one. Their alarm must have not gone off. They must have wake up call. Well. Call Valley Bureau direct. Yeah. Copy Valley Bureau. Nice pattern. Mm -hmm. This is connected. Yeah. Uh, let's see what the message is. This light, I can't see where my mouse is. Is there a moment? Yes. And that's it. Control P. Print. So the water warm up. It's a laser print. Nice. So the setup that they had was was excellent. It was really impressed with the way that the ACS team uh, set up and operated. They really leveraged Winlink really well using the the peer to peer. So that that setup where they they were doing peer to peer connections but they were set up in a way where they would peer over to a digipeter and then they had a solid connection from that digipeter into where the unified command was located it allowed them to dynamically create 
uh, a network and infrastructure on the fly and pass their traffic over a very uh, both geographically uh, diverse area and a very large area as well. Then also adding in the, the HF connection for other traffic that needed it to be able to have stations that were much farther out that were outside of the range of VHF to be able to send their traffic via, VA, uh, via HF into a station and then peer to peer send that traffic into the unified command worked extremely well. As we were talking to uh, the operators, let's uh, let's kind of move now into some of the some of the lessons learned from it. And and for that, what I'll do is I'll I'll bring the guys back up as well because we're gonna we'll get into kind of a little bit of a an overall discussion as to what we're doing. Um, actually, before we do that, um, there was there was something else that occurred, and let me bring David uh up to screen here uh because in the middle of our exercise um we had a real world uh event that took place you want to kind of just uh, briefly kind of highlight a little bit of what that was david yeah sure i'll talk about it a little bit um while we were operating we were getting towards the end of the event and you know every time we do a drill we, we say on the on the radio over and over again it's a drill it's a drill it's a drill you should be saying that not quite as often as you ID, but over and over and over again, so that you know people that just don't turn on the radio think the sky is falling. But uh, pretty much every time since the first drill I ever attended, there is always some kind of real world event that happens. And that is literally the words you need to use on the air reporting something in that there is a real world event going on. And you know, we were up in the beautiful Santa Monica mountain um, along a dirt road, and there's a lot of hiker traffic and uh, mountain bikes. And while we were, weren't quite shut down uh, for the day yet, but while we were getting towards the end of the event, um, we heard some yelling and screaming and somebody said they needed first aid. And somebody said, you know, you know, call unified command and call for the fire department. And uh, a mountain biker had, had gone down while they were riding along the trail there pretty close to where we were. And, um, because you're kind of remote, there's no pay phones up there. Uh, it used to be a long, long time ago, but um, there isn't any other way to get out. And I guess their cell phones didn't work. So, um, you know, we kind of activated, launched in, and the ACS guys called the fire, the 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 gentleman that was working HF at, at the station that was about a mile away. And they called in and relayed um, for emergency services to show up. And it took a while. And, of course, there are so many amateur radio operators there and you know, for so many different organizations, uh, the fire department, sheriff's department, the amateur radio emergency service supports the hospital departments. There's lots of skill sets there. So people were grabbing medical bags from from cars and running down to like make sure that, that there was somebody there with them right away. Now, I being in charge of our station with traffic to pass, um, I let someone who was you know more capable at first aid than I was. We had a an RN as part of our team and she, you know, she grabbed some stuff out of my medical bag and she grabbed something out of hers and, and went and took care of him until um, first responders showed up to pick him up. But you have to be prepared to know not only what you're going to do during your drill or, you know, in a real world event, um, be prepared for, you know, things to happen in a moment's notice and how to, you know, take the information in and figure out what to do with it and pass it on and responsibly, you know, no, I don't think he's going to die or I don't think this was going to happen or he's not going to lose a leg. It's really all real world, right? He fell, his helmet broke, he's bleeding, he's got contusions. Here's where it is. Here's where he is. And, um, and then just leave it to that. And then answer the questions that the 911 operator had. So yeah, we had real live stuff happen. Plus, it was a, you know, for us, it was a training day. Chris showed you videos from um, uh, all of the stations there. You know, there was the stuff that Aerie shot and the stuff that the ACS and the DCS guys um, shot up there. And the, the sheriff's department and the fire department folks, those were, you know, the best of the best up there. That's what they send in net control. Um, Aries, we take this as a, as a training event. It's been two years of COVID. And for the most part, our hospitals haven't allowed us to kind of be on site and, and work in the hospitals because they were concerned about our health as volunteers um, with COVID and, and so on and so forth. So we haven't been out in the field. We haven't been operating this way. So we sent operators out to 10 or 12 locations. And as you saw at Net Control, we really use this as a training experience to put you know, new or recently new operators on the air such that they could run the net, they could hear what you're supposed to say, and they could learn um, that for um, our 
operating standards that please and thank you aren't words of the day. It just adds extra traffic. Um, and that it's very important that the traffic that gets passed gets passed word for word, even if it's confusing or doesn't completely make sense. And uh, when you get traffic from other uh, other teams that you need to clarify what that traffic is and, and what they're really asking to do. So um, it was a lot of fun. It was a really good event. Um, we really tried to honor the spirit of the event. You know, I, um, I left my cell phone off in my vehicle. Um, I never turned my uh, Wi-Fi hotspot on. Uh, our station was all amateur radio. I know the uh, incident commander who spent a lot of time working with us. I know his cell phone was on, and I think he said he wasn't going to answer, but maybe once or twice he did. Um, and, um, you know, you learn. Uh, there's a whole list of things that, you know, could we do better? Of course. And the reason that we do these tests is to see, you know, what are the areas that we need to focus on? What do we need to train on? Um, you know, whether it's, you know, net control presence and skill or the forms that you need to use or remembering that when, you know, it's it's not best of times that when link works a little differently if you're not just going all up into the CMS and um, and practice and practice and practice. So a lot of fun, a lot of a lot of lessons learned. I uh, that that kind of brings back to one of my kind of big takeaways. Um, uh, two two things. One was the the difference in the the go kit versus the the drop kit, as I know Steve Waterman likes to likes to call them, and uh, and the go bags that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. So so as I've kind of started to to kind of tease out this in in my own mind, uh, the way that I've been kind of thinking about these would be your your go bag. That's the the bag you're going to grab and kind of run with. Uh, because you've, you've got to get out, you're, you're trying to evacuate, you're getting out of there pretty quickly. Your go kit is, is a much more kind of expanded kit of, of gear that you're going to bring with you. Um, I know both David and I showed up basically with a car full of, full of other stuff for, for being able to deal with whatever challenges came up on the fly and uh, we had various different antennas and masts and and a variety of different gear. I know even when when we got up to the location, you know, even the the mallet in order to be able to drive one of the the stakes into the ground was down in my car down at the bottom of the hill. And David had a had a hatchet that we could use to be able to to pound the stake into the ground with. So so that's more of the go kit. And then it it hadn't really occurred to me that those the gator boxes the 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 rack mounted kits uh, as you think about those as like the big go box it's much more of a drop kit and when you saw the ACS groups uh, in action where they literally they dropped it on the table and they were ready to operate and set up and they had some additional uh, gear with them that they were able to implement and things like the printer was a really nice addition they had a very small little laser printer there it was just a monochrome a uh, black and white printer that they were using to, as the wind link traffic was coming in, they could very quickly uh, take that, uh, take a printout of that and turn around to the other operator, hand off that traffic and, and keep going with it. Uh, so, so those were some, some really nice little, little bits and pieces that they had. Um, another takeaway for me was the, the critical need uh, within the WinLink program, within the WinLink system, to have radio profiles or or radio basic profiles that you could set for the different radios that you may operate with. Where I'm used to operating with three or four different radios uh, that all have different requirements in different settings, and when I need to be able to change from one radio to another because I've gone out and I've deployed as opposed to teaching the wave talkers or, or producing content. Uh, having that dedicated system would be really nice where it's always set up ready to go with one uh, set of gear for an emergency communications setup. But most of us don't operate like that. Most of us operate, we have multiple different radios that we're going to be changing. And so having some kind of a tool inside of the WinLink program where you could say, hey, I'm operating with my 705 and all the different modes would have those settings that could load back up. I think is a really big deal and something that uh, would be really nice to have implemented within the system. It would be a real uh, win for everybody uh, to have something like that. 
Um, other than that, uh, David, Dan, let me bring you guys up. What kind of takeaways of lessons learned did you guys have? I got a whole, I don't know, six or 10 months worth of um, monthly training curriculum for, you know, different practice stuff. Cause we need to, uh, we used to break folks out and do net control around a table with four people and you, you know, round Robin who was going to be net control and give them a bunch of, you know, random traffic pass, but we haven't met in two years other than in zoom. And we probably, I think by the end of that, we couldn't meet um, in person, we were starting to get better about breakout rooms and testing those things out. We need to get back to those, those skills, how the forms work, um, what's important about the forms, um, how to set up your kit so that, you know, I have a, I have a drop box. That's what we were using there. Um, there were some challenges because the operators were new and didn't understand exactly how the radios work. So, you know, they'd want to turn up the volume or turn down the volume or change, and they change a the frequency or mess with the squelch or some other, other setting, you know, knowing the equipment, knowing the radio, um, but just being ready to, to do it. The uh, probably the biggest takeaway for me where we were located, uh, as I said, we were very busy and the way the way our group operated is we uh, every player had a timeline. Um, this event occurs at this time and we interacted with other players that had a different timeline. And one of the things we ran into a couple of times uh, was that. Uh, mostly because of readbacks of messages, we got behind on our timeline. The problem with that is that then you start getting responses to incidents that you haven't transmitted yet. And so, you know, you're getting, you're getting things that couldn't happen in the real world. But um, uh, the conclusion to me was that we really don't want to do readbacks, particularly with the fire department, because there are calls that go out to more than one b uh, battalion at the same time. So you're going to have multiple operators responding to you. And if each of them reads back the entire message, you're going to get behind. And uh, I don't think it's necessary. You know, either they believe they got the message correctly or they don't, in which case they ask for a fill on what they didn't get. So that was the, the big thing. We had similar thing a year ago when we did a similar exercise. And I think we need to make that real clear. Uh, the other thing is, as David said, basics. Uh, we're rusty. We haven't done this uh, other than a few minor things in, in a long time. And there were things like stations uh, saying their call sign first and then the call sign of the station they're calling. And that adds confusion. So uh, we just need to, to clean up the basics, uh, come up with a uh, kind of a consistent policy on readbacks, uh, that type of thing. Hey, Dan, from your law enforcement days, didn't you do that? The I'm calling you, Dan, David's calling Dan. We were supposed to, yeah. but a lot of people shortcutted it. Yeah. Um, but it's a little different in that case because you're, you're basically – everything's going through dispatch. So it's sort of assumed that's who you're, you're calling, but yeah. And in, in, in my business life, you know, safety and security stuff that, that we do, all those folks are, you know, retired law enforcement or want to be or whatever. And it's always that format. And so I always have to like take my ham radio hat off because in, when I do that, they're like, you're doing it wrong. I'm like, no, yeah. you're doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, in our case, it should have sounded something like, South Bay, Manhattan, two Lincoln, two David. Mm -hmm. But a lot of places, a lot of officers just two L two David, and then sometimes you just get two David. Yeah, and, they're just calling. You know, it, it it was not good practice. Well, you know, and sometimes you know, it was a problem. In some ways, if you're just if they're doing the shortcut and they're just calling, if I just do NR six V like they were doing, you know, calling, that's mm -hmm. actually more amateur radio than not. But in the world where it's, you know, it's, this is, you know, the security desk calling Fred and it just, you know, it, it you know, or this is Fred calling the security desk is what they want us to do. And I'm just like, no, it doesn't work that way. It's not yeah. right. I, I use in my, one of my classes, I use the example. If you were at the uh, airport and you saw a friend across the 
the right room from you, you wouldn't say, this is Dan, Bill. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. You know. Hey, I'm Dan, Bill. Yeah. Oh, no, that's it's exactly the wrong way. Yeah. yeah. I've used that example before, and they still say, no, it's not the way you're supposed to do it. Yeah, you got to get their attention. Yes. And, Absolutely. And particularly in a busy radio environment. You know, like I say, if you're if it's one person that only talks to the other person, that's one thing. But you know, where you've got you know a dozen stations that are listening, you you've got to pique their uh, their interest. That's why the fire department and police departments often use an alert tone. I wanted mm -hmm. an alert right. tone yesterday. Yeah, but but, uh, but you know, everybody, the first thing that you tell the new ham to do is turn on their turn off that beep thing on the Baofeng because yeah. they could send it every time. Yeah, you know, there was an interesting. I went through some of the the questions that came in, and there was an interesting um, uh, question or comment or whatever. And and I think that this is a really great lesson to learn, especially as a new ham or a, a new MCOM operator. Um, one of the things you have to have in your mindset is that you will never know everything that's going on. And you may want to know that. It may feel important to you to know that. May, other people may be asking you to tell them those things, but you have to be you know, comfortable and understand with, you got officially reported these four things. And those, as far as the event is concerned, those are the only four things in the world that really matter, other than things that you can see, smell, or feel, right? Yeah. And people like wanna know like, well, what's going on there? Or why did it happen? I'm like, it doesn't matter. It, it, is, not, yeah. it is not important to your role as, you're a communicator and it, you know, and we often re remind our folks that it doesn't matter if it's an amateur radio, uh, if it's digital, if it's voice, if it's um, CW, if they put you in front of a commercial radio or a fax machine, um, you know, you're there to serve your agency and, and you know, do the best you can and help uh, mitigate whatever, whatever's going on so that you can, you know, add value. Yeah. I mean, you, there's, there's certainly value to being situationally aware. Um, when I was on patrol, I used to listen. Uh, I carried a scanner, and I'd listen to the adjacent agencies because I wanted to know if there was a pursuit coming my way or if a suspect was fleeing my way. But my responsibility was what was happening in my city. And so you you want to be situationally aware, but you don't want that to distract from your primary responsibility, which... Uh, is what you really need to, uh, I, I, you know, you, you get that with people who drive, oh, I can text and drive. It's like, well, not, not and do a great job with right. your primary responsibility, which is navigating the car safely. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me, uh, let's, let's do a quick check of uh, what, uh, of the checking <clears throat> that came in as we uh, proceed to wrap this up for today. And then if you're hanging around for the after party, uh, we definitely have, uh, we, we want to hear uh, some more information from, from <laughs> everybody about some exercises that you've participated in as well and, and our general uh, uh, chat that we have. So uh, here we'll jump back over to the wind link and uh, let me go ahead and check one more time for uh, any check-ins that have come in, we'll go ahead and just start that and see. Yeah, we still have a few more coming in. If you haven't had a chance to go ahead and send in your check-in, go ahead and do that. I'll do one more check after this. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're watching this on any of the social media channels, uh, please go ahead and uh, give us a like for the, for the video if you're finding this, this helpful. It's a great way to support us here on Wave Talkers. Uh, to make sure that the content all gets shared around. So we'll start that. And looks like we've got all the check-ins that have come in thus far. So we'll go ahead and click on the map. And, and as usual with the mapping, uh, you got to make sure that you receive all of the forms. It's a question almost every week, it seems like, that somebody writes in. It's like, hey, we're trying to do an exercise. We're trying to do a Windlink exercise. And I'm trying to just test out the mapping features. How do I get the maps and you have to receive a form uh, that's a mappable form into your own account in order for this to work. So as you see us do this every single week, that's the that's the real trick to the magic to making it work. And, and we did an episode back, I think it was like episode eight or something like that, where we walk through this process in detail. So I'm going to check the WinLink check-in forms here and uh, we'll go ahead and display the map for those. I'll blow that out to full screen for us so we can get a, a better view 
on the globe where those are coming in, uh, it's always a good idea to check what your filtering is set to. When you bring up one of these maps, you get to the upper left corner, just click on the set filter button. It's right there. And you can see I'm only looking at check-ins that have come in within the last uh, 10 hours, which is pretty much the, the kind of window for, for folks. There's a lot of people who, who watch the show um, and they want to be able to check in. We'll get a, a couple of check-ins just a little while early uh, on those. So we'll go ahead and uh, just set this to 10 hours. We'll hit save. And these are the folks who have sent in their check-ins uh, just now. So we've got, uh, looks like Bill out in Hawaii, uh, Kilo Hotel 6 Uniform Uniform. Thanks for joining us. It uh, looks like Terry down in uh, ZL land. Uh, he had a little special guest in the pre uh, Great to say hi to her. Glad she's having a, a good day at school there. And uh, we've got, uh, looks like Franz in uh, Austria and uh, rolling over there in Germany. Uh, we've got some stations up here. Uh, Victor Echo 3, Yankee X-Ray uh, coming in up in Canada. It's like... Uh, our friend up in Bangor, Maine. Let me go ahead and zoom in a little bit on North America. We'll just click the zoom in button a couple of times. This is always tricky. You got to hold down the right click button and then click and drag in order to pan the map. That's one that always kind of catches me. And we've got check-ins kind of all over today. We'll just kind of roll over a few of these. Thanks uh, everyone who uh, checked in and wanted to uh, let us uh, get yourself on the map. Uh, see Steve there. Um, we're going to bring Steve up here in just a second uh, also because um, he had a he had a couple of things to, to bring up in chat as we're kind of wrapping up here. I see um, John down there in uh, down near Houston. Good to see you on the map. Uh, some folks up here in uh, in the middle of the country uh, coming in from Colorado. Hey, Tammy, I got your uh, got your check in there. Excellent. Great to see you as well. And uh, Bill, of course, coming in from the Pacific Northwest and uh, folks coming in. There's a lot of folks that uh, normally I think would be checking in, but there's a lot of people participating uh, and keeping an eye on what's going on down in Puerto Rico, uh, where they currently don't have any power uh, right now from the hurricane that just rolled through there. So uh, thanks everyone who, who did send in a check-in and we, we got them. We'll continue to check in on those all week long. Let me bring myself back up to uh, uh, the main display here and we'll bring the guys uh, back up to screen as well. Let's see, add a spotlight, add uh, Dan a spotlight. David, any closing thoughts that you got for us today? Yeah, if, um, if you expect to respond to some kind of disaster man-made, uh, natural or otherwise, and you support your community, you know, I give you props. I think it's an important thing we should be doing. Um, but I also think that on a very regular basis, you should get your gear out and play with it and test it and practice and practice some more and um, teach other people too. Dan, kind of thought you got. Um, props go out to uh people like David and Ruzi and uh, Bill Koss, Michael Schlenker from ACS, who planned this because it's a lot of work. And, um, and a, the old saying, herding cats, trying to, trying to get not only people in your own organization, but others, other organizations to uh, send you the information you need to make your plans uh, can be tough. And so uh, respect goes out to those guys uh, because they did put in the work. And because of that, uh, we had what I think was a very successful exercise and uh, I think a very important one for us. So kudos to those guys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, David, you had something else for us? No, I, I you know, um, we lost a good friend. Uh, Aries lost a good friend last week. Uh, Dennis KJ6 UVQ had been supporting events like this for years and years and uh, he'll be missed. For sure. For sure. For sure. Um, my takeaway with this for, for this past week, I was not planning on uh, being available. I wasn't expected to be available for the exercise. I was supposed to be working um, and I uh, was doing some, some work with a client and uh, that all got postponed. So just a few hours before the exercise was to start, um, I said, okay, sure. I'll come down. And so I threw a bunch of stuff in the, 
in the car, drove down and set it up. And so it was a lot like a, a very quick deployment for me. And uh, some of my big take a home, takeaways for that was even though I'm operating on Winlink every single week um, and several times during the week, I, I still struggled with making sure that I had the scenario with the equipment that I had with me set up to be able to all operate. You really do have to practice and practice and practice with all of your gear. And you really have to know it inside and out. And, and with amateur radio, you've got a lot of capabilities to get your message through. And so being able to know how to quickly put together the equipment that you need in order to be able to operate and get that message delivered is really key. And the, the only really way to do that is, is to continue to practice with it. So um, I want to thank everybody who, who joined us today uh, live. Uh, we've, we've come to the top of the hour. If you find the stuff that we're doing helpful, uh, please uh, give us a like on, on our Facebook channel or our, on, on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, on any of the videos that you find there and, and watch them, share them with your with your friends. If you still find what we're doing really helpful, then uh, you're certainly uh, welcome to go on to the Wave Talkers website where we've got the Buy Us a Coffee link. That really does help keep all this infrastructure up and running and keep us going with, with all of the new content. So uh, we still got one more week of emergency preparedness month. So we'll do something else next month uh, or next week. And then uh, we'll move on to some other topics. Uh, but uh, I want to thank everybody who joined us live today. And if you're in the chat, if you're in the Zoom session, hang around for the after party. Uh, we're going to open up the mics and uh, take some questions and chat. So with that, we'll say seven three to to everybody who joined us online, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us on Wave Talkers Live. Seven three.